Oops. All right, all right, let's just go with that. All right, welcome everyone to our final Fair Housing Friday of the month. Um, this Fair Housing Friday um, titled, Is Building More the Cure? is going to be a space to explore um, ways to ensure housing equity beyond just building more housing. Um, and it's, it, we did have a little chit chat in the beginning. And I do wanna say that we are certainly advocating for building more housing. We, we do have a housing shortage here in Vermont. Um, and so that, um, just to say that there is no one suggesting that that is not something that we want to happen. Uh, but we are thinking about, well, if we are building more housing, you know, how do we really prioritize the people who are, um, in, have the greatest need for housing. Um, and then just to kind of set the stage, um, it is Fair Housing Month. I'm here um, from the Fair Housing Project of CVOEO, Champlain Valley of Economic Opportunity. I am joined by my colleague, Jess, also from the Fair Housing Project, and our three panelists who I'll be introducing in just a second. Um, and I do want to do a, a very quick, uh, very, very quick history of fair housing um, and, and just to say too that we do uh, have expanded workshops where we talk about the importance of fair housing and what that means for our state um, and of course we're always welcome um, always happy to do it in your community um, if, if you were um, interested in inviting us and we do also include a lot of fair housing education for tenants in our uh, free uh, Vermont tenant workshops um, I've already covered the um, please stay muted part, which is an important purse, part, part to just touch on. Um, uh, the Fair Housing Project is a statewide program. We work to protect and expand the fair housing rights of everyone who experiences housing uh, discrimination and housing exclusion. As part of that mission, we coordinate the thriving communities, a, state, a statewide collaboration to raise awareness about the economic and social benefits of affordable, inclusive housing. And then each April, which we are coming to the end of, sadly, we recognize the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, which put in essential protections into federal law, making it illegal to discriminate in the rental, sale, or financing of housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, family status or disability. Um, each state can expand on those protections based off of their community's needs. So here in Vermont, we have expanded the Fair Housing Act to include uh, state protections of age, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity, receipt of public assistance, denial of development based on permitting of uh, uh, develop, de denial of development permitting based on income of prospective residents, and most recently, victims of abuse, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, this means it's against the federal law for you to be treated unfairly because of your membership to uh, of any of those federal or state protected classes. Um, and discrimination is not always obvious. Uh, it can take many forms. It can look. Uh, it can look like a landlord refusing to rent to you um, based off of being part of those uh, protected classes. But it also could be more nuanced, um, such as if, if um, you have a different uh, terms or conditions in your lease than your neighbors based off of being part of those protected classes. Um, and so as always, we uh, encourage you to reach out to us at the Fair Housing Project if you have concerns about housing discrimination or housing access. And we are happy to um, work with you to talk about what your options are to um, enforce your right to equal access to housing. Um, do you know, it's like talked about unmuting. Um, Jess has been really kind in putting some links in the chat. Um, and then again, there is uh, more than 40 people uh, registered for this event. Um, we are, we do have people on our Facebook Live. Uh, so just, you know, be kind that this is the community that we're sharing. Uh, we do really want you to participate. So feel free to put questions in the chat. And uh, just, just keep in mind that uh, we have some complex housing issues that we are going to be talking about today. We are by no means going to solve our housing crisis and our, um, in the next, you know, 40 minutes of us talking. 
Uh, but we do really want to use this space as a creative uh, way to generate ideas around um, housing equity. Um, and so I'm joined here by my uh, three excellent panelists. Uh, we have Bora Yang uh, from um, the Human Rights Commission, Oiso uh, Makuku, which I should have asked Oiso, I, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Um, most recently, uh, CEO of Main Street Landing, but also a board member of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition and um, uh, formerly a community development director of Essex. And then we have Elizabeth Bridgewater, um, the director of Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust. And so each of our panelists are going to speak on this topic a little bit, and then we're going to open up the conversation for our Q&A. So be generating your questions. And uh, Bor, I think we're going to go ahead and start with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I am honored to be here, to be invited here, and to be a part of this conversation, a very important conversation. So I am the executive director of a state entity called the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And for those of you who don't know, it's a state entity that enforces the anti-discrimination laws in Vermont, in state government employment, in places of public accommodations, and most importantly, at least in my opinion, is housing. And housing is the most important area, not only because we all know that the right to shelter is the most basic of human rights, but also it is the right that is connected to all other rights, the rights to schools and school choice and workplaces and transportation and proximity to healthcare and what healthcare is available to our family members and then the community that we get to build in that area as well. Um, so the question of the hour is, is building uh, more the cure. And um, I think we have to finish that question with the cure for what, right? Is it the cure for lack of housing? Are we talking about the cure for the lack of affordable housing? Is it, are we talking about the cure for discrimination in housing? And I think um, despite sort of how you finish that question, the answer is kind of the same, which is yes and no. It is part of the cure. It is There is no singular cure. Um, it reminds me of diet pills. You still have to exercise and eat right, even if you're taking them. So I just kind of wanted to review some of the, the facts that we know to be true about the state of housing in Vermont. We know that in general, the state of Vermont has been slow to build and we're needing to make up lost time for that. Um, we know that building is not necessarily more cost effective than for a person to just buy an existing home. Um, if you are able to afford um, an existing home to purchase an existing home that's on the market, it's typically pretty old and most of the time in disrepair. We know that there are limited contractors and the cost of materials have increased significantly. So it's not as simple as buying um, a home that is $250,000 on the market. It's $250,000 plus another $100,000 to fix that plumbing, that that old those old pipes, those, uh, um, that kitchen. Um, and we're not talking about beautifying a place. We're talking about making it really livable and safe and um, so forth. Um, we know that uh, materials have increased significantly in cost. So even if you could find those contractors, uh, which are few, um, that it would be really expensive to even make that happen. We know that the demand for housing is driven in part by people who have cash and not just a little bit of cash, a lot of cash. Um, investors and out-of-state buyers who enjoy more economic opportunities and higher salaries are able to come in here and really beat Vermonters with cash um, offers um, and no contingencies. Um, we know that housing providers who consciously discriminate can get away with it. So if you have a housing provider who knows they don't plan to ever rent to Black people, well, guess what? You'll never discover that because 10 out of the 11 people that have applied are white and probably qualified for that housing. Um, we also know that housing providers exhibit significant implicit bias. They turn away perfectly qualified prospective tenants on the basis of race, specifically African-American prospective tenants, on the basis of national origin, disability, and familial status. 
We also know that banks disproportionately deny loans to Black and Latino applicants. And then we know that the banks that use criteria for who they give loans to, such as um, I mean, in, uh, who they consider to be credit worthy, uh, the criteria that they use is who has cash and who has a higher salary and what our debt to income ratio and credit score. And I don't necessarily have all the time to talk about each of those things, but each of those things, there are disparate um, outcomes and disparate treatment in each of those things and how we calculate those things as well. Um, so building more does not necessarily fix all of those issues, but I want to say that it can fix some issues. We know that people are more likely to come forward with their meritorious claims of discrimination and harassment in housing if they are not stuck. If they have other places to rent and to buy, they will report discrimination and harassment in housing. We know that. We know that when people come forward with their claims of discrimination, we have opportunities to hold housing providers accountable under the law. We have opportunities to teach housing providers who are ignorant of the law. And we have the ability and opportunity to teach our legislators, our governor, and all the decision makers at the state um, who uh, need to know that the prevalence of discrimination in the state of Vermont is pretty high. And they need to know that because let me tell you that every time I'm asked to testify on a housing bill, the question always comes up, how many people file this type of complaint per year? And I say, I can answer that question for you. But the truth is, it doesn't reflect the state of discrimination in, this, in Vermont. These numbers are not the reality. And I want you to know that. But they nevertheless want to know the answers to that question. If we have more housing, we're going to have more people who are going to file those complaints of discrimination. Building more homes does mean more supply to meet a significant demand. Even if those investors are purchasing those homes, it probably is going to mean more rental properties are available to choose from. So I wanted to just quickly identify those factors and also just say that um, I, I'm really grateful to be here to answer any questions about the Human Rights Commission and also to sort of brainstorm with my fellow panelists about what the solutions may be moving forward. I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth Bridgewater. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Let me just start by saying I feel so inspired. I've never met you, Bor, and I, I just am so excited by all the things that you laid out. Thank you uh, for setting the stage for us. Um, so I am a housing provider, and so uh, both uh, as a landlord and um, as a housing developer. So when I got the title of the talk, I thought it was really provocative and um, it had, it uh, required me to um, kind of think about this housing development question through this lens. And um, we experience a lot of issues that relate to equity. And so I, I wanted to lay out what some of them are for you today. Um, so there's a lot of new people flooding into Vermont and, you know, um, in preparation for this morning, I read the, article in Vermont Digger about climate refugees. And then just kind of coincidentally, um, I got a card from a friend who I had been out of touch with for years, literally in my mailbox, um, who experienced that Ashfield, Ashland fire in Oregon that was described in that article. And it turns out she's on our wait list and didn't know that I was the executive director because we had been out of touch for about 10 years. Um, and several of her friends are on our Putney Landing waitlist, all from Ashland, Oregon. So it, the whole uh, issue around climate um, refugees flooding into Vermont became very personal for me this morning, just as I was preparing for this. Um, we also obviously saw tons of people during um, the early, the first year of the pandemic, just flooding in to Vermont, um, southeastern Vermont at the time. I don't know what the numbers are now, but we saw a report back then that Southeastern Vermont got hit harder than any other um, of the uh, counties, Wyndham County in particular, people coming in from New York and Connecticut. And I'm speaking with the bank, one of our community bank um, presidents, he said more than half the housing closings in that year were from out-of-state buyers uh, claiming first, you know, claiming it as their first residence. 
Um, in Brattleboro, we're seeing a lot of asylum seekers and refugees from Afghanistan coming into our community. And right now, many of them are uh, living at the SIT campus because it's been hard to absorb folks into the housing market. And then um, a lot of people are just moving here because they're in high priced areas and they're relatively higher priced than Vermont and perceive this as a more affordable place to live for them. And so there's just a lot of new folks coming. I think the prediction is more are going to come. And as Bohr laid out, they're coming into an environment where we've had a housing crisis for many years that are affecting local Vermonters. Um, housing production you know, has been declining since the 1990s. Um, the real estate market heated up dramatically in the last two years. And then of course we're struggling we know this very acutely with um, construction costs and labor supply chain issues that are really driving up construction costs. So, so you know, the question is how do we accommodate new folks that we do want to welcome into our community and, and still meet the needs of folks that are here and, and especially those that need housing the most. So when I think about these issues, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, that Folks with wealth have so many more benefits and rights that they enjoy that are baked into policy. And we deal with a lot of zoning um, policy because that's part of, a big part of our work. And, you know, just I want to point out that in many Vermont towns to permit a single family home that doesn't require a variance is an administrative function. You know, a person with housing plans goes into the local permitting office, sits down with the administrator, presents their plans and, and they get their permit. So it's a very streamlined, easy process. Um, the decision is made by the administrator. There's no public hearing, there's no public input. And so just on like the basis of being able to afford to build a home, um, the pathway to, to doing that, to building it and, and moving into that home is, is very, very streamlined. Contrast that to multifamily housing where you have the same project uh, that rather the same uh, dynamics where the project meets all the um, housing um, and other town bylaws. So it, no variance is being requested. Um, instead of that being an administrative function, it is a public function. So there's public hearings, at least one, sometimes two, sometimes three. Um, there's a board that reviews the plans. Um, the public has the opportunity to weigh into the project. And in the case of affordable housing, there is an opportunity to um, get what's called a priority housing project designation and avoid the even more onerous permitting process, which is Act 250. But if the density is uh, at a particular point, um, that is not available. So just the permitting process alone opens up the door for, or for individuals in towns to oppose projects and bring to the surface a lot of other issues that come into play around um, discrimination or against renters. And um, board did a nice job of of talking about them and they they are basically you know classism racism bias against folks with substance use disorder bias against folks that have mental health needs um, we see them surface as dog often dog whistle issues so people will talk about concern about parking or they'll talk about concern about traffic um, sometimes this this has come up for us recently fair housing has actually been turned on its head a little bit and used against us and that we're not going to be able to meet the needs of people that already live in town because fair housing doesn't allow us to do that. And so all these new folks are going to be flooding into the housing and we're not going to be meeting the needs of people that live in town. Um, when things get really heated and they do and people don't feel um, as inhibited, um, we see more direct comments that are very much uh, related to these issues. Um, one recent uh, letter to the editor that is opposing one of our projects uh, talked about being afraid to, that your catalytic converters are gonna get stolen at night because um, you know, poor people are gonna be moving into our town. So there's just a lot of, um, a lot of uh, classism, I think that really shows up. 
So, um, you know, for us, I feel like we are working on these issues on a number of fronts, some on the, um, the, the more transactional level, and then some more on the more adaptive level working with our residents. Um, the first thing I wanted to also share about the transactional level is kind of how money flows in Vermont. You know, people wonder, and this has come up with this project that we're working on, you know, why certain towns get housing and why certain towns don't. Um, and really the, the big driver is public infrastructure, water and sewer. That, that's the biggest driver, I believe, where housing goes in Vermont. And it kind of comes in layers. So um, a housing developer can't really afford to install public infrastructure just for that project alone because it's just cost prohibitive. It's like running a municipal water system, for example, on a 25 unit multifamily development. It's just not cost prohibitive. It's cost prohibitive for us. And so um, we need towns to in invest in public infrastructure. Um, the other thing that allows for is for special zoning uh, overlay districts and designations. And those overlay districts uh, the two that confer the most benefits and the most competitiveness around projects require public infrastructure. So you can't get those overlay districts if you don't have public infrastructure. And then when you go up to the next layer and look at how funding decisions are made, those overlay districts are the top priority locations for where housing is going to go. So if we want to spread out opportunity across Vermont, we need more public infrastructure in order to uh, prioritize other communities and, and really um, allow for other communities to diversify. Let's see, what else did I wanna? I wanted to talk a little bit about um, permitting again and just say that the way the permitting is structured, you could have a, a project that is widely supported by town folks and have broad public benefit and in this case, we're talking about a housing crisis and we do need to build more housing. And yet one individual with $250 can derail an entire process, delay it, slow it down, make it more costly. I think the, the real um, extreme example of this was the project in Woodstock where um, Evernorth and Twin Pines had a project that was opposed both at the local permitting level and then at the Act 250 level and what went from a $1.9 million project over almost a 10 year appeal period turned into like a $9 million project. So not only did that delay much needed housing um, for renters in that town, it also drew resources away from building more housing somewhere else. And those, those things have real consequences. So those are kind of the, the um, policy and transactional things that we think about. But the other thing is work with residents who are already renters and um, we're um, going through a process internally for us around training our staff on restorative justice practices, um, elevating resident voices, um, really prioritizing um, resident driven projects and processes and um, just really showing support for what residents want living in our homes. And um, we just hired a team of folks in the last year to help us implement some of these um, values that we have. And we're really excited about the work. Um, we're just seeing a lot of residents um, appreciative of the attention that's not around just compliance issues and um, you know the regulatory issues that are abundant in affordable housing, but also community building initiatives and and really asking residents what they want. And, and then of course, just working through um, conflict that happens in multifamily housing and any, any kind of um, community where people are living in cr close proximity. It's not, not just unique to multifamily housing, but that, that's our world. So we see it show up there. And just trying to build community and, and help people solve problems together in a way that um, opens up understanding, opens up, um, appreciation for each other and um, and just being able to live in community, even if people are coming from different cultures or backgrounds. And so we're working on um, the issues from that angle as well. So I'll stop there and um, 
I'm looking forward to hearing OISO and, um, and then uh, hearing any audience questions. So thank you so much for having me here. Hi, my name is Awisa Makuku. Um, I am working for Main Street Landing currently, but a little background about me is that I have worked in, um, I'm an urban planner and I have worked in, um, in city planning for a number of municipalities, including um, Burlington. I worked in the planning and zoning office. And so I'll start to get into some of the issues that, um, that Elizabeth brought up. And, um, I most recently worked for the uh, the town of Essex as their community development director, and I truly believe that housing is central to everything that we do. It's central to cities, um, and it's central to our lives. And what, the moment that we find ourselves in right now is a really interesting one. Um, Elizabeth and Bohr mentioned other um, mentioned uh, Vermont the Vermont Digger article. Um, NPR has had, has had conversations and Seven Days actually published a really interesting article this week. Um, there is a perfect storm, if we wanna throw that sort of trite phrase around again, um, of issues that are creating the unaffordability in this moment of, of time. Um, we've got the, the climate refugees, we've got um, the um the high cost of materials and the clogged supply chains as elizabeth mentioned we've got the um we've got the fact that um some people have been living in their parents basement for however long and during covid were able to save up money and now have the money for down payment because down payments are a huge hindrance to any sort of purchase of um of housing we also have the um the the people who um who find our housing extremely affordable because again they come from other places where um where covid uh, sorry where um uh where the cost of living is a lot higher and so we'll either buy a second home here um because vermont has been labeled a safe place or, um, or actually move here. Um, another complication with, um, with COVID is that, uh, as a result of COVID, is that a lot of people who formerly had roommates now want to live alone because there's so many, there's so much fear as we move into this endemic phase of the pandemic that if my roommate gets COVID, I may get it and that's gonna put me out. And so maybe I should think about living alone at this point. And so that's putting, a, that's putting more um, pressure on the market as opposed to, um, and uh, I do realize that this conversation has been going on all month. And so I think we've, we have come to the conclusion that building more is not, it's part of the cure, but not the cure, not the, it's not the silver bullet. Um, and I'm gonna focus more on the tools and policy ideas that um, that can help to ensure housing equity and opportunities for our most vulnerable Vermonters. And I'll start at the local level. Um, zoning, zoning is a great tool. Zoning in my mind, when I, when I was working in zoning, I always considered zoning an equalizer and we know that it's not. So attention needs to be paid to, um, to how, um, how our zoning approaches multifamily housing and how um, how it allows for um, for different types of development based on bonuses, incentives, and just straight out um, permitting, as as was also just mentioned. Um, the permitting process, yeah, is it is very much slanted towards single family homes. You um, there are oftentimes special districts that are in Burlington. They're called non design control districts. Um, unless there's a special feature like the waterfront. And in that, in that case, really, you really just do. You pay $75 or $80, get your zoning permit, and two weeks later, you're good to go. Whereas if you have multi, multifamily housing or housing in denser areas of, of a municipality, um, there's often a multi-layered process, which takes time, which costs money, um, and literally costs money. Um, costs more money 
through the permitting process, um, I had I also recently worked for um, for Feral Properties for five years as we were developing Cameron Rise, uh, which at the time was 770. I believe that it's now um, closer to a thousand units, but the the sheer cost of the permitting would make anybody choke. Um, most of the zoning regu most of the zoning um, permit fees were created for single family homes or duplexes or maybe a sixplex. Let's go crazy. But once you get past a certain um, number of homes, and I'm not sure how many it is, I never did the math on this, but the fees stay the same. And so it's literally this upward curve where from which you can't get any relief. And so if you have someone who wants to build 100 units, should the permit fees be something like $200,000, that's, those fees are set, the fees are supposed to cover staff time to review a project. And the way that they're set up right now is, an, is um, sort of an escalating fee because it doesn't really take more time to review a 100 unit project than it does a two or 300 unit project. And so that's something that all municipalities can look at. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think that, um, that while zoning has been used as exclusionary in a lot of instances, and I mean, we can point to, um, to very obvious cases in Vermont, um, you know, we can adopt things like inclusionary zoning, which make a big difference in communities. And, and it, it, inclusionary zoning gets a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a bad rap because people say, oh, it's not making a difference. Inclusionary zoning is making a difference to every family or household that gets one of those units. So someone may say, oh, it only created 13 units in the past two or three years. Well, that's 13 more families or 13 more individuals or households that can now live in our community. And they're not isolated. It's not an affordable housing project. It's not public housing, someplace that, that is more stigmatized. Um, the, um, the whole concept of inclusionary zoning was not just to get developers to, to figure out how to get developers to foot the bill to include more housing, more affordable housing. It was, the intention was to decentralize affordable housing units so that people could live in different parts of the community and find, or they could look for, for housing in different parts of a community, not just in one building or in one place. I'll move on from that. Um, I, um, I also think that, um, that working um, or telling you, working with or talking to your municipality about creating dedicated spots on your, com uh, on your community's development review board, um, design advisory board, um, and or planning commission for people with housing experience or expressed interest in housing. Um, as you would an architect, an engineer, an attorney, a bike advocate, um, participant and participants should come from a range of housing types. Everybody sitting on your, on, on your review board should not be single family homeowners. They, and it's just that you have a different perspective as a single family homeowner. Um, from what you might have as a renter or someone living in a group home setting. Um, boards and commissions also seem to be a stepping stone to other opportunities for the people that sit on them. And I think that we've seen that in our communities as well. On the state level, I think that some of the, um, some of the tools that have been provided that again, if your municipality has not applied for them, encourage them to apply for bylaw modernization grants that is looking at um, your zoning bylaws and thinking about how they might be exclusionary and how they might um, and how they might evolve with the current needs of the community and the um, and the populations that you hope to um, hope to attract. Um, the um, the neighborhood development area aspect of the um, of designated downtowns or designated village centers as proposals go through Act 250. 
are um, is also very important. Um, Elizabeth mentioned the priority housing project designation, and that's that's part of that concept. And um, and what the neighborhood development area does um, that the state should streamline and expand on is to um, it takes the um, it doesn't allow for an Act 250 appeal of a res residential development in areas that um, where residential development is allowed based on the vague notion of character of the area. Because just like parking and just like traffic, um, character of the area is this, again, extremely vague notion that appears in some zoning ordinances, um, but also appears in Act 250 reviews um, on which a developer can be held up extensively in court. And um, and so um, initiatives like that on the on the part of the state are very important or um, to 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 put forward and 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 keep thinking about. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not enough that it's in there right now. Can it be better? Um, can it result in in more fairness and more um, and more affordable units? Um, I recently learned that um, the policy that the, the 1987 um, policy of permanent affordability um, was created by the state. Uh, and for those un unaware, under a 1987 law, housing subsidized by Vermont, by the um, by the state of Vermont um, that received federal funds or state funds must be permanently affordable to lower income Vermonters. And um, and that's a goal that's usually enforced by a covenant or a deed restriction. Uh, we can also support our nonprofits and encourage um, uh, policies like like the model that um, that CHT has created for shared equity. Um, that is um, that's a that's a great pathway to home ownership. Um, and we can support groups like the Vermont, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, um, which, as was noted earlier, I am a member of that committee. Um, I'm on their ste steering committee um, because it consolidates information and attempts to think comprehensively about issues obstructing affordable housing in Vermont um, and the vulnerable residents that are affected by these various issues. Finally, um, I'm just going to give you a little laundry list of like my own brainstorming about um, addressing areas related to housing. Um, there are addressing our community's needs for public transportation, for level walkable streets with good lighting levels, um, with appropriate fixtures, of course, that don't cause light pollution because um, whenever there becomes a toxic environment, that's usually what ends up being affordable and um, and that can be avoided. People don't have to. Um, people don't have to live in substandard conditions, or shouldn't have to live in substandard conditions to um, to have an affordable unit. Um, mixed use districts um, allow people to have their needs met, and they include possibly employment opportunities. And so, encouraging um, encouraging, encouraging um, some of those are useful. I think that. All of us who are working with housing need to, need to stop speaking in initials and acronyms and allow more people to join in the conversation and reach people that we're trying to um, that we're trying to help to actually understand what's happening. Um, uh, the um, uh, and I will refer you to the um, to the seven days article that talk that talked a little bit more about um, uh, other things like revolving loan funds and um, and offering down payment assistant and um, and employer housing and employer housing is a little bit of a touchy one because uh, um, it's rooted in some of the historic um, uh, like Pullman Company um, developments which you you may or may not have heard of but it's worth it's worth googling if you um if you have a moment to um to understand um how some of the employers manipulated the people for whom they were providing housing. Um, we should encourage financial literacy and these programs need to start with children. And um, 
the uh, and I guess the last point that I'd like to um, to bring up is the concept of missing middle housing, which is sort of interesting, and I'm not quite sure where where I stand on it um, as it's proposed now by the state, but um, certainly the um, creating more housing for all of our diverse populations, other than the upper tier and all of the um, the tax breaks and um, and mortgage breaks that people get. Um, from buying expensive homes, um, of course, shouldn't be supported at the local level. Anyway, so that's it. Hopefully, I've given you some food for thought. And um, and it, it's not it. Actually, I have a lot more in my head. But um, I think that we should get into conversation because everyone probably has a lot of questions. Thank, thank you, Aliso. And thank you to all our panelists for um, dumping so much information to us. Uh, in, in summary, like. I'm just going to do the in summary thing because we covered so much. Um, we talked about um, the way that our our growing our new growing population coming to Vermont is impacting perhaps our our potential first time home buyers, especially in the southern Vermont area where um, the population has changed pretty quickly. And and we know that folks like uh, that are in the process of the the climate migration, as they say um are folks that often have uh, more resources to do so so that's something that we're really thinking about um in terms of um like housing equity of course we um board talked extensively about how uh housing discrimination does happen in vermont what it can look like and how that doesn't just impact where people live but what they have access to so what does it mean if um you know if, if a certain population of people uh, can't buy homes and are renting and therefore uh, perhaps not stably housed because we don't have extensive renter protections. Uh, and then we also uh, went over a lot of different kind of policy ideas uh, to think about when we're advocating in our communities for more inclusive housing. And a lot of those ideas were based in um, uh, zoning and other kind of like civic engagement uh, pieces. So really thinking about, um, well, and and also pointing to the fact that it's the vocal minority that often shuts down uh, the housing projects that we really need. So how how do we really get the community um, engaged? Uh, how do we drop the acronym so that the housing uh, conversation is accessible to folks uh, and get the our, our majority that does know we need more housing uh, on board with housing advocacy? Um, we got a lot of information here in the chat. Um, Elise, did you want to, um, you're the first person that kind of chimed in there. Was that something you wanted to say out loud or were you just kind of like putting a nugget for people to think about? I can't see if Elise is still here. Yeah, I'm still here. I was mainly just putting in a nugget because I am, you know, really engaged in these issues and sort of can't help myself. Do you want to say that nugget out loud? Uh, well, I had a couple. Um, you know, one in particular, this issue of the streamlined review process for single family homes or duplexes, but anything above that requiring uh, site plan review or conditional use review of some kind and um, trying to understand if there's, a you know, uh, incentive for towns or a, a case for a pitch to towns to open that up to at least a fourplex, um, which wouldn't do so much for the affordable housers necessarily. Our, the way our money flows, as Elizabeth put it, is usually into larger scale multifamily projects that are 20 to 30 units. But, um, you know, sometimes a scattered site opportunity comes along and certainly, um, you know, and the private developers can have a role to play here. Um, and I, I also threw in the chat some of the, the pushback I've heard to that idea of at least going up to a fourplex for um, administrative review. And and um, the thing that I I kind of recently learned, and not to like um, put my ignorance into a recorded space, but um, I recently learned about how zoning isn't a place where we can restrict renting. However, it is a place where we can restrict uh, restrict housing density. So when we're talking about um, when we can't do things like fourplexes, that's also an opportunity to potentially uh, rent to four different families in the same unit. And I apologize if that's um, obvious for some folks. It is just something I'm I'm personally wrapping my brain around. Um, I do see uh, 
a couple hands up. Um, I might, uh, since we have hands up, maybe I'll start with the hands up and then I'll finish out our, ch our questions in the chat, um, if that works for everyone. Um, I'm going to start uh, with Gary's hand and then I'll have Elizabeth and Aliso respond. Um, <coughs> Gary, take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Winslet. Um, my wife and I moved here um, with our daughter in 2019. Um, I'm a professor at uh, Middlebury College and I teach political science there. Um, I wanted to sort of highlight something that came up in a couple of different comments um, that actually ties to some of the stuff that so, sort of I research. Um, and that's the, the importance to distinguish sort of between the regulatory parts of government and like the provider parts of government and, and trying to just be really, really smart about how we get the mix there, right? Right. So some of the regulatory stuff that we might want to do is really intelligent, like some of this inclusionary zoning stuff. But some of it doesn't make any sense. You know, um, Oisa, I think, spoke of permitting fee reform. I mean, there's a way of talking about that. That's like a sheriff of Nottingham tax on housing. Right. That you're just going to make the taxes really, really high on sort of multifamily housing. And that's that's not fair. That's not helpful to, to, to the process. That's not helpful to you know, the, the, the broader goal of having people housed where they want to be housed, um, you know, and, and we've got some other examples of that, right? So the way, you know, one of the things that we often talk about in political science is the way that regulation that may sound well-intentioned can in practice turn into a vetoocracy on the back end. That is, you create these regulations that sound nice, but then one person can use it to hold things up. Um, you know, the, the sort of character of the local area kind of stuff that gets brought up. And so it just might be useful to think about ways in which you can actually streamline some regulations or even remove some regulations that might be unhelpful. So I know right now there's actually a height limit around UVM in Burlington and it's 35 feet. It's not very high. And so by just preventing even mid-rise, I'm not, I'm not talking, you know, Manhattan or anything, just some mid-rise housing, stopping that pushes students out of the area which pushes students into other places. And that has this, this downstream effect. Um, some of the super persnickety zoning sort of where I live, um, you know, that, that puts, my wife and I would like to buy a house we can't really afford to. Um, and that actually makes me feel really bad for working class people because if we can't afford to, to buy, who below us can? Um, but that's, that's put us in an apartment. This is an apartment that somebody who makes less than us would probably really like, and then you could see people moving up. And so, you know, the, this discussion of the missing middle, I think is an important one, because if you can sort of create more of those homes for, for people in that $250,000, $350,000 range, not rich, you know, but, but sort of in that middle, they sort of lease the apartments they're currently in, and then everybody can kind of take an inch step upward. And so I just think it's, it's important for us not to be zero sum and how we think about these things and just try to be smart about how we can, you know, because I say deregulation and that's going to sound like a dirty word to a lot of people. It just sounds icky, but like there actually are some of these rules in place that are actually really counterproductive. And I think it would be smart to, to take a look at which of those we could undo. Um, so, so thank you all for your time. Thanks, Gary. And Elizabeth and Elisa, I don't know which of you had your hand up first. Okay, Elizabeth has got it. I think it was me and I just wanted to um, add one more uh, comment to the permitting issue and that is when when a permit is uh, appealed at the local level Vermont is what's called a de novo state which is that it's the, the whole entire permitting process starts from the very beginning as if you're applying for the very first time except for instead of in front of the local zoning board you're doing that at the environmental court. So all of the costs associated with bringing your experts, your architect, your civil engineer, your traffic engineer, um, you know, whatever the experts that you have to support your application, you have to pay for that all over again through the appeal process. And so one idea is to, um, is to eliminate that, just allow the appeal court to review your application and confirm that it meets all the zoning guidelines of the local zoning um, town and, and either dismiss it up outright or identify where there's some gray areas and narrow that down. Right now, people can take a buckshot approach and pretty much uh, address every single 
point in your zoning application and you are starting from scratch. So it's, extre it's extremely expensive um, and lengthy. So that's just one, I think, um, one suggestion that can balance this cherished and, and in some cases really positive um, dynamic of local input because you don't want to have the the public not be able to weigh in at all on what's happening in towns because that can actually be used in a discriminatory manner as well. So I just wanted to add that point. And then I'm glad we said that you brought up the shared equity program. We have one of those too. And that is a really wonderful way to make uh, home ownership more equitable. So I'll, I won't go on and on because I want to leave space for others, but I wanted to add those points. And um, yeah. I just wanted to add a quick comment because someone mentioned that um, uh, because of the comment that was made about um, that zoning um, um, can't restrict renting. Um, it it, it kind of can. <laughs> um, it can't in so many words, but when you have a, um, you can use, a, um, apply a low lot coverage in an area that would, that would not support um, more than um, a certain amount of house or um, or units and couple that with parking requirements and your rental housing can't be built or your your old Victorian can only be cut up into a duplex. At this point in time, the state has um, has put in safeguards so that if you have a single family home, you can have an accessory unit by right. Um, and that's a de facto duplex, but anything above that, like a threeplex or a fourplex, is still going to be um, is still going to be restricted by um, by parking requirements in a community. And there need to be some parking requirements. I mean, if if there's no public transportation nearby, there need to be because if not, you're crippling people. In um, in a recent conversation about removing um, parking spaces on North Winooski in Burlington, I was dumbfounded that nobody brought up the renters, everybody talked about the businesses, but there's so many rental units in that area that have no parking associated with them because they're, they're these subdivided houses. And now all of a sudden, where are those people supposed to park? Are they not supposed to have cars? Because if we're not creating, if, if more jobs aren't being created in Burlington, or if there aren't that, that people are eligible for and can actually secure, um, how are they supposed to get to work? And this is that sort of housing um, employment disconnect that happened that requires us to be so dependent on single on, on single occupancy vehicles. And it's unfortunate. I don't want to get into my car to drive, but I live in Hinesburg because that's where I could afford a home. And how am I supposed to get from Burlington to Hinesburg when there's no public transportation? So, um, so zoning can absolutely restrict renting and it doesn't that's the that's the insidious part of zoning where you either have like large lot um um it's it's impossible to bring it together enough acreage to to um build multi family units um or you restrict it in other ways and so anyway just throwing that out there I don't know, Jess, do you think we have time for one more question or are we like really? Yes, I have the yes. Um, and I, I do know there's other questions in the chat. We're going to work to answer those questions in our follow up blog post that will include this rec recording. But since we're on the topic, I'm going to read this question out loud. That's kind of um, iterating a lot of what we're already talking about. Um, so from Michael, uh, the questions asked in, mun in municipalities with high land prices, and large minimum lot sizes or density restrictions, the minimum parcel of, bu of buildable land per unit often costs more than $100,000. Do you think these density restrictions are intentionally exclusionary or have municipalities just neglected to look at how these rules exclude lower income and even middle class families? Uh, and I'm just going to add to that, what does that mean if there's a town that's um, there's one town that has exclusionary policies like that and two towns over is where all the affordable housing is like what does that mean for the community and how the community is shaped um 
At least so. You have your hand up, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> Massachusetts has done really great things to streamline permitting um, in communities where there are not affordable units. And that's a model that I think that, Burling that Burlington, that Vermont should look at a little bit more. Um, the, um, my, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it does happen. I, I can build on that being a, I'm actually a Massachusetts resident, big secret, and uh, grew up kind of in affordable housing in Massachusetts. It's the 40B uh, permitting process. And it, it is an inclusionary zoning law that requires a certain amount of affordable units for every project over a number. And the so there's um, the other provision of the law is that if towns don't have 10% of affordable housing in their town, then um, density requirements are lifted. So it's a state regulation that is a bit of a carrot and stick approach and it forces towns to deal with um, affordable housing. It requires them to either have it in their inventory or um, at least have a plan to get there. And so it's, it, it's, it can be really controversial, but it, um, it works. Um, to answer the question that the, the person raised about, is it intentional or not? I, I think that um, it's probably um, yes and no, because I do think that some people just are not aware of, of uh, how these patterns affect other people because they're not really tuned into the needs and, and uh, concerns of other people that they're maybe not in relationship with. And I think that's one of the real tragedies of segregation in America is lots and lots of folks just don't, aren't really up close and personal with the concerns of other people that live differently than they do and that have different opportunities than they, they do. And just long, long, long standing um, segregation patterns, I think, have really crippled us from having empathy and understanding for each other. So I think it's more of a blind spot than intention in some cases. And when people become aware of these issues, and that's why awareness raising is so critical, um, some people will start to change their thinking around it. The yes answer is absolutely. Some people are very savvy, and we're seeing this in one of the towns um, that we're working in right now is, you know, trying to figure out where the levers are that they can pull to stop this project. And it's very intentional and very strategic. And so I think there are some people that are absolutely fully aware of what's happening and are using whatever they can to keep the status quo that they, where, where they can benefit the most. May I also just quickly add that, um, that what I forgot to add um, was the, um, that's what the bylaw modernization grants are, are hoping to target um, places where it isn't intentional. Um, because a lot of times, if you go into your local zoning office, um, the zoning administrator or the person, um, the town planner reviewing the, the project, their hands are tied. They, they just don't know. And, um, and for the boards, it's not, it's not their day job necessarily. And so to bring these things to people's attention is really important. And the state has provided this funding mechanism for. Um, for uh, reviewing zoning ordinances, and I believe it's going to be re it's going to be funded again because they um there was so much demand. Uh, and I know we are at time, but I just wanted to ask Boar, do you have any last thoughts to share with us before I do my wrap up? I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me, and I've learned a lot here too as well, and um. For, for what it's worth, I think we're in the year 2022. So if we are still ignorant about disparities, racial disparities or otherwise, it is intentional, even if it feels unconscious or we're not aware of it. We can no longer excuse um, the what we see in our community by lack of knowledge. And so, yeah, thank you. Really important note to end on. Thank you for and thank you everyone for sharing uh, your time with us today. Thank you so much to our panelists, like really incredible conversation. I didn't expect anything less, but it just, um, I'm honored to be sharing this space with you. Um, I do have to, uh, I, I would love to thank our sponsors as well. If um, my, my co-host out there is able to put up the picture. 
coming up. Um, and then just to say, this is the, um, we're coming at the end of Fair Housing Month. We have a couple of events that are happening um, before we wrap up the month of April. So um, if you're in our area, in the Chittenden County area, please join us tonight at the University Mall. Uh, Art So Wonderful has a really great uh, uh, art um, event that they're hosting tonight that's mostly youth led and I can say that there's some real great talent that's going to be sharing their voices tonight at this event. So please join us at the South Burlington uh, University Mall. And then tomorrow we have um, our Day in the Dirt activity. You can find this all at fairhousingmonthpt.org. I just, of course, have to say, you know, Fair Housing Month is wrapping up, but fair housing is critical when we're having these housing conversations. We should always, always, always be talking about not just how to build the housing, but how to make it truly inclusive, how to make our, our communities in, com, uh, in integrated, inclusive, diverse, and serving the needs of a wide variety of people. And we really, like, we should be pushing to make sure that we don't have these situations where, like, there is one town that's you know, higher income, only single family homes, uh, two towns over from a, a place where like all the, the more affordable housing is located. I think that we can make it happen. And I just um, am grateful for everyone that's joined us today to learn how to be a part of that. Let's keep these conversations going all throughout the year. And we'll see you next April to check in and see how we're doing. Um, thank you, Bor. Thank you, Aliso. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to our audience members.